Uh, we never leave the emergency room now without doing a CTA in our stroke patients, and even our high-risk TI patients, we feel the same way. I order a CD perfusion in select cases, and that's increasing. I think the, the number of patients that we can get important information on CTP is growing, and there's now evidence from clinical trials for using CTP as well, so it's exciting. This is a topical review that we did in stroke. What's useful about this topical review is our entire CTA protocol is available in a table in every nitty-gritty detail, including MIP imaging and FINS and all the things I'm going to talk about here this morning. So please go to that stroke paper if you'd like to uh, view some more details about the technical aspects of our CTA protocol. Okay? In our shop, CTA is mandatory and we never wait for creatinine if it's a disabling stroke. Okay? If it's a major stroke, we never wait for the creatinine. And I'm going to give you my justification why that's why I feel comfortable with that. Okay? The reason for this is we have an enormous amount of evidence now suggesting that contrast inducing nephropathy is a rare problem, very rare problem. This is a large propensity matched analysis done by the Mayo Clinic. Contrast group versus non-contrast group, 20,000 hospital charts were evaluated, the patients were matched, and the, the injury to the kidneys was no different if you got contrast versus didn't get contrast. There was absolutely no difference, even in high-risk patients. And Mayo Clinic now does not wait for creatinine. Okay, and disabling strokes. That, that should be a, a, a strong a message as possible. Mayo Clinic does not wait for creatinine in major strokes. This is our recent paper that I did in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic, Neurons Over Nephrons. Okay? Neurons Over Nephrons. And this is an, a meta-analysis of all of the stroke papers looking at the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy in, in patients who receive CTAs and stroke, and the risk is at most about 3%. But in fact, if you don't give contrast, your acute kidney injury rates are probably pretty similar to that number anyway. So there really isn't an issue here. And the number of patients that went on to hemodialysis after a CTA was 0.07%. That's one in a thousand patients. Okay, very rare situation. This, in terms of flow with imaging, we have a philosophy of getting patients as fast as possible to the CAT scanner. We stop, when a acute stroke comes in, we stop at the triage bay for three minutes. And the only reason to stop there is airway breathing circulation. Okay, to make sure the patient is stable enough that they can go to the scanner and without having a major problem. And we ought to make sure the IVs are in place and they're complete from the triage bay. They're immediately taken directly to the CAT scanner. They do not go to the emergency department. If they're stable, they go straight to the CAT scanner. The emergency team is very much involved in their care with us, but there's no stop in the emergency department. We're able to actually demonstrate some extremely fast door to needle times by doing this. Your, your time literally from the door of the hospital to the CAT scanner can be less than five minutes, five to seven minutes at most. Okay? And then when the patient arrives, we do a plain CT scan, and if there's no blood, we immediately mix the TPA. Now I know in, in Vietnam, I've learned in my visit here so far, that consent is a, a significant issue for patients in terms of paying for the medicine, so there is an additional bit of time required for that, I understand that. In our shop, basically, we, we do the plain CT, and then we immediately mix the TPA, and while the TPA is mixing, we do the CT angiogram. So the CT angiogram is not delaying door to needle time in any major way for thrombolysis. But it's an important additional piece of information to decide about thrombectomy. Okay? So basically, we give the TPA as soon as the CTA is completed. So we mix during the CTA, walk back to the scanner, we give the TPA uh, right after um, the CTA. Okay? And what this allows us to do is meet targets. In North America, the targets now are moving towards something called 30, 60, 90. 30 minute door to needle, 60 minute door to groin puncture, 90 minute door to reperfusion. You can do this if you give the TPA in the scanner and if you are efficient in your vascular imaging. If you have to wait for creatinine and bring a patient back for a CTA, it'll be very difficult for you to meet these targets. Okay? Second question. What does your standard non-contrast CT CTA protocol look like? Okay. Number one, thick 
plain CT only and a single phase CT of the head only. Thick and thin plain CT with single phase CT of the head only. Thick and thin non contra CT with single phase CT of the head and neck. Number four, thick and thin CT with multi phase CT of the head and single phase CT of the neck. Or I don't care about all that, I just do a CTP. Okay. So who's for number one? Anything for one? No ones, that's good. Number two? Very few, no twos. Number three? Who's for three? Number four? Okay, excellent. This is very exciting. I'm extremely excited. We've already got converts in the room for number four. That four is our operation. This is exactly how we do things. And number five would be, of course, I think a, 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 certainly a visible option in terms of doing CTP in all cases and not worrying about the rest of this. The thin section CT is a very useful piece of information, okay? Very useful and free piece of information. This can be done by the CT techs by simply reconstructing the thick images that we standardly get at no radiation cost. I repeat, no radiation cost to generate thin section CT. Why do we do this? Because we can see the plot, and the size of the plot much better. I'm going to talk about this more in my second talk later today. This is a 5 mm thick CT scan. You can see that actually it's pretty hard to see that plot. But there's, there's probably a little distal M1 proximal M2 occlusion there. On the thin section CT, it's way easier to see. You can see it in multiple images. You can get a full sense of the size of the plot. And, it, and this is going to be, this is important around determining whether TB is likely to re-analyze the vessel, whether thrombectomy would be a necessary step for that patient. Once it's the size of these thin section clots get much over one centimeter, it's rare for TBA to dissolve that clot alone. So moving on now, the other thing we do that's completely forgotten in the field is we do sequential imaging. We don't do a spiral acquisition of the brain. We point and shoot, move the gantry, point and shoot, move the gantry, point and shoot. So the, 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 basically the, the, the head is not moving when we image. Spiral acquisition is constant moving and imaging. You lose quality, you lose gray-white differentiation when you, when you do spiral imaging. It's very important to do sequential, and that will, it adds about 10 seconds to the plain CT scan, but that's well worth it because you get much better quality determination of gray-white changes in the brain, which is important for aspects. Okay. The other thing that, you should, that people forget about is you should inject in the right arm. Right? If you inject the contrast for the CT in the left arm, you get much more reflux into the vein, venous, venous system, to the jugular veins, and that can sometimes cause problems for interpretation, especially for the carotid arteries. Okay? And in terms of calling the interventionalist, our moment that we call the interventionalist is we do the CTCTA, we give the TPA, come back and start looking at the source images on the console of the, C of the CTA, and we see on the source images the M1 occlusion or the carotid occlusion. That's when we call our interventionist. And then they participate in subsequent evaluation of the imaging. Okay? And one of the things they'd really like to look at is the coronal mid images of the neck and head. That gives them a road map of where to put their catheters and what types of catheters to use for thrombectomy. They can actually plan the entire procedure in their mind by just looking at the coronal CTA from the arch to the vertex. In addition, we use MIP images. These are thick reconstructions. They're done automatically by our techs, 23 mm in size, axial, coronal, and sagittal. They can give us the geometry of the plot and the, and the vessels. We also look at leptomeningeal filling of the, cor of the cortex. Okay? So this is basically where we look at the filling in the brain okay? on, the, uh, on the affected hemisphere. There's different ways for filling to occur in the cortex. Okay? We do this with multi-phase CTA. Why do we do multi-phase CTA? Because we need temporal information about the filling of the leptomeningeal vessels in the brain. If you take one snapshot in time, you actually don't see and sometimes miss the collateral filling in the brain because it hasn't happened yet. It's five seconds or ten seconds away. So we do a neck and head, and then we move the gantry back down five seconds later, scan the head again, move it down, scan it. It's actually four seconds between each um, um, uh, where the gantry moves down and then images. So there's eight seconds apart. 
for the second and third phase of the CTA. So neck and head, gantry back down, head, gantry back down, head. It's a very simple approach, and it only is one millisievert of radiation dose. Okay? All right. What do we get in terms of information from this? We get delay of collateral filling, an impairment of washout. So delay would be, it takes a little longer to get there on the affected side. Delayed washout is it doesn't wash out of the brain by the third phase of the CTA. And then the extent of collaterals. How do they fill the entire hemisphere of the brain? And all three of these are important. So we actually grade collaterals in multi-phase CTA that's actually really easy. Okay, so this is excellent collaterals. This is a patient on the first phase of the CTA where the collaterals fill in just as fast as the normal side with a rapid washout by the third phase of the CTA. That's the top three images up there. Good collaterals has a slight delay and a slight slowing of the washout, but it's only a slight delay. Fair collaterals have quite a long delay to collateral filling. You really don't see the collaterals until the second and third phase, and there's very poor washout by the third phase of the CTA. But the, the extent of the collaterals are normal. The collaterals are getting there, but just very slow. That's brain at, at high risk. Poor collaterals never fully fill in and, in and incompletely fill in by the third phase of the CTA. Minimal collaterals have only minimal vessels by the third phase, and no collaterals has absolutely no vessels uh, showing up at any of the three phases of the CTA. So you can break your collaterals accordingly. The other thing that we get from multi-phase CTA is we can find the occlusion easier. Sometimes it's tricky to see where the occlusion is on the CTA. And if we do, we look at the washout on the third phase of the CTA, that that's um, points us where to look for the occlusion. So that third phase of the CTA, you have a delayed washout. It's like a hang-up of contrast. And that's where you go look and you can find your occlusion very easily. And we publish that in the wrong way. So that, this approach can get you to that 30, 60, 90 concept where you're calling the cath lab team, once you've assessed the collaterals and deemed the patient eligible, uh, the whole process moves quickly. The other thing to think about in all this, or another way to think about this, is what I call the four C's. Okay, what are we getting from imaging? Clot, core, collaterals, and catheter abscess. And I'll, I'll now speak to you a little bit about core. Uh, remember that core and collaterals work together. They're actually uh, a small core usually means good collaterals, a large core means bad collaterals. The two of them are actually uh, together in this process. When we think about core, I want you to think about this Wikipedia slide. Okay? Remember that once a significant amount of the brain dies, patients do poorly. Their chances of a good outcome fall off and their mortality escalates. And that seems to start to happen at an egg size lesion in the brain. That's a 68 mil lesion on Wikipedia. A tennis ball is 140 mils. Okay? A tennis ball in the brain generally has very high mortality with a very low rate of good outcomes overall. Okay? The whole subject of stroke treatment is really to treat patients when the core size is still small enough that patients can do well. Okay? One indirect way to estimate this is aspects. Okay? Aspects is a scoring system we developed a number of years ago where we divide the area of the MCA territory into 10 regions, the ganglionic region, which has seven areas, and the supraganglionic region above the caudate head, which has three regions. And we look for early ischemic changes in at least two consecutive cuts of the scan. Okay? And so M1 is frontal lobe, M2 is lateral to the sylvian fissure and the temporal lobe, M3 is posterior to the sylvian fissure, insula is medial to the sylvian fissure, lentiform and caudate, and internal capsule. The internal capsule is a pretty useless part of aspects. We shouldn't have included it in aspects, but that we developed this a number of years back. Uh, higher up, we divide the MCA territory in M4, M5, and M6. Okay? So a good scan is somebody with a high aspect score, between 8 and 10, minimal early ischemic changes in the brain. This is your marbles and ping pongs, less than 20 mil lesions of the brain. High aspects means very small areas of ischemia. These patients can do really well because if you reperfuse them because they haven't lost much brain yet. A fair scan of someone in the five to seven range, that's your, uh, your golf balls and eggs, and your poor scan is your low aspects patient. Those are your tennis balls in the brain. Those patients are gonna do badly. They've got pretty extensive MCA involvement. So how do we measure aspects? We will score aspects when we see mild hypoattenuation. What's mild hypoattenuation? 
That's a reduction in the uh, density of the affected hemisphere versus the contralateral side. So you can see the gray white here very well on the left. On the right, there's a subtle loss. You can still see a bit of gray white, but it's clearly different. Okay, that's subtle, but it's definitely there. Okay? That's pretty hard for individuals to, to get used to, but with practice, you can get better at it. That's mild as attenuation. You would score each of the zones on aspects as a reduction uh, in that situation. So let's walk you through one scan. This is a carotid proximal M1 occlusion. You can see the hyperdense sign there. This left hemisphere is in trouble, but it's subtle. There's a little bit of blurring of all the gray white here. You can still see the gray white very nicely on this side, but it's just losing its definition on this side. And so we would actually score very low aspects here. M1, M2, M3, insular lentiform cotton. All those areas would be reduced in this case. And then higher up in the supraganglionic zone, you can see an area here which doesn't look right. And we would score M4 and M5. M6 is a bit borderline. You could maybe not call it because it looks a little bit better posteriorly. There's the infarcture 16 hours later in this case. This, this vessel did precanalyze it. It's a case. Okay. If you need help with aspects, please come to our website. This is a free website called aspectsinstroke.com aspectsinstroke.com. It's free. You can walk through a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, case examples, and we also have evaluation of collaterals in that uh, website as well. It's free for everyone to use. Aspects is now pretty well standard in most stroke clinical trials as a, giving us a, a bit of a sense of the size of the uh, infarct core. In terms of TPA, I generally treat at all aspects ranges until the aspects gets very poor. There, there isn't a lot of data down there, unfortunately, so we really don't know. But the rates of good outcome with these sort of aspects three and last are really pretty low overall in, in our large TPA registry. The risk of symptomatic hemorrhage does go up. It's about a threefold increase uh, with lower aspects. Um, the current TPA guideline does not have a specific aspects cutoff, but does say that if you have multi-lobular hypotenuation, TPA is not recommended. Okay, especially if it's a clearly visible hypodensity. In the, uh, in the thrombectomy, and I'll come back to thrombectomy tomorrow when I give a talk on thrombectomy, um, but uh, one of the things that was uh, very important from our Hermes collaboration using thrombectomy, and uh, this is from five of the trials, is we had a 19% symptomatic hemorrhage rate by treating a low aspect patient with thrombectomy. So we, there is a safety concern in this group, more trials are needed in this low aspects population, and that, the, there are a couple of them planned right now. We don't have sufficient evidence of the safety of thrombectomy in these low aspects patients, and there, there is that worry in the room. Severe hypotenuation, on the other hand, is a more obvious situation. This is where the hypotenuation is obvious to the eye and is as dark or darker than normal white matter. As dark or darker than normal white matter, there's a great example of that, very dark very similar to normal white matter. There is a little uh, focal area of severe hypotenuation in the basal ganglia, which is equal to the normal white matter. And there's an obvious one. This is actually a little darker than normal white matter in that example. Uh, visible infarct was associated with um, more risk of symptomatic hemorrhage. So the more severe the, 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 the hypotenuation, the worse the risk. This is a paper we recently published combining CT perfusion with non contra CT information. And the combination of severe hypotenuation, okay, poor grades, uh, so very dense uh, drop in, in density, so a lower low, an area of clear hypotenuation or hyperdensity, plus low, low blood flow on the perfusion, suggested the perfect storm for risk of lead with the TPA. Okay, that was that combination uh, uh, in the data that uh, seemed to come out. Okay, this is a subacute infarct. This is really a contraindication of TPA, I think, for the most part. Um, and so whenever we see a clear subacute lesion, I usually avoid TPA. I might consider thrombectomy in those cases, but not comfortable with TPA. Now remember, when you're using aspects, you have more help now. You don't have to rely on aspects alone. You can use aspects and collaterals together, and that's what we do. We, in fact, look at the aspects, score it, evaluate the collaterals and grade it, and then go back and look at the aspects again. And there's a strong correlation there. Patients with a very low aspects typically have no or poor collaterals, and they're infarcting very rapidly. Their time window is very short for any type of intervention. 
okay? And treatment is probably relegated for just young patients treated early for the most part in this scenario. On the alternative, the high aspects patients with minimal changes typically have excellent bladders. You do the multi-phase CTA, and on the first phase of the CTA, all the, all the leptomeningeal vessels fill in. There's no delay and good washout. It's that perfect combination of small core that can give us a long time window. And I suspect we don't have this data in diffuse and dawn, which I'll talk a little bit about tomorrow, but I suspect the vast majority of the patients uh, were to fall into this category. We know that the average aspect score in dawn and diffuse, uh, or at least in dawn, was, uh, was about eight for an aspect score. So this is a, a small core group of patients. So we'll have to see what all that means. So the current recommendations in terms of guidelines are to do a CTCTA. Where does that put us with CTP? And I don't even feel, I, I think Henry's probably a better speaker to, to cover this topic of CTP. And I would ask him to elaborate on that if he gets a chance uh, uh, in the questions today. But uh, I use it in selected cases. I, I would say probably about 30% of the acute strokes that I see, I order a CTA on. And there are four scenarios that I really like CTA in terms of clinical decision making, and I'll walk you through those for a minute. First, stroke diagnosis uncertainty. When I, when I don't know it's a stroke versus a mimic, I really like doing CTP here, because it really identifies for you a patient. If the CTP is normal or increased, it's not a, a major stroke. It's, it's probably not a stroke at all. The other place where we have emergent data is the late time window, and then I'll talk in a, in a future, uh, one of my later talks, a little bit about mild stroke occlusion group for deterioration and uh, this issue of bleeding risk with severe ischemic. ischemic. So for in terms of stroke diagnosis, the diagnostic certainty for stroke goes up dramatically if you do a CTP. You can be really sure you're dealing with a stroke if you do CTP, so you're less likely to treat a mimic with thrombolysis. Yeah, you also see increased flow, and there are a number of beautiful examples of seizures, Wernicke's encephalopathy even, press, where you actually see increased flow in the area uh, uh, where neurologic symptoms are exhibited. Right? So it can be quite helpful there. The Donna Diffuse 3 trial, of course, is now, we now are aware that both of these trials have been stopped for efficacy, that we await the publications of both of these trials, but they both use CT perfusion. And so really now, CTP perfusion needs to come of age. We need to now start to apply it in this late time window and use it to, to identify patients with small cores and scheme. RAPID is the software that was used in both of these trials. The problem with RAPID is cost. It's about $30,000 annually, US dollars annually. I don't know what, what the cost might be here in Vietnam, but it is a significant cost um, uh, to bear. There are alternatives. MyStar is what is used in Australia, works quite effectively, much uh, more, if, uh, much more an expensive option. Or you can use any of the vendor softwares: GE software, Toshiba software, Philips software, Siemens software on the speed CT scanner. And, and the problem, the challenge with the with these different softwares is speaking the same language. Each of us would speak a different language with our particular software. Right? So it's important to standardize it, and that is one advantage that RAPID provides, and I believe MyStar can, can do that similarly. The other thing I will say is you need to standardize your protocol. And one thing that we've learned is you must image for more than 60 seconds to get a full bit of information uh, that allows the, the cerebral blood volume map in particular is not accurate if you do a very short acquisition. There's very good literature on that. So it's important to acquire the information over a longer period of time. I think I'll just stop there and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you.